Good morning, Colorado. This is the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. It is June 28th, 9 a.m., and we are in our normal business agenda. We will initiate today's meeting with a roll call. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Ackerman. Here. Commissioner Cross. Present. Commissioner McGowan. Here. Commissioner Mesner. Here. Commissioner Oath. Here. Commissioner Ray. Here. Commissioner Robbins. Here. Mr. Chair, you have seven out of seven commissioners present. Great. Good to see all six of you as well as staff. Um, we look forward to a good meeting today. Um, we're going to depart from our regularly scheduled agenda and we're going to elevate Mike Leonard, uh, who is with our staff and who will be able to present us with an update on some fires on the West Slope um, and as they may or may not impact some oil and gas operations. Mr. Leonard. Uh, as you all probably know, uh, the Spring Creek fire, I believe started Sunday um, afternoon. Um, uh, the fire service was on it pretty quick. They thought they had it knocked down. Um, uh, it, it, it blinked back up again on my last report. Um, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're cutting in and out, Mike. Do you want to maybe turn video off and then we can just hear from you? Now you're completely sure. frozen. Is that better? Yeah, that yeah, is better, no, actually. Okay. Um, again, fire is just under 3,000 acres. We have been in contact with Division of Fire Prevention and Control. Uh, control. Once again. Uh, David Gates, one of our team with them, we're working on... Let me, uh, let me call. Can I call in? Yeah, Make that'd be great. Yep. Let's try that. Okay. Um, while we wait for Mr. Leonard to leave and then call back in on his cell phone, um, let's turn to another agenda item. Commissioner comments. Does any commissioner have comments? Commissioner Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to update, um, both the other commissioners as well as the listeners today, that I spoke with the Office of Information and Technology yesterday, went through a presentation regarding the draft forms for the chemical disclosure bill that was passed last year. Um, as you know, the, the legislature passed HB 22-1348, which requires operators and manufacturers to um, identify the different chemicals that are used in the, in the completions process um, in oil and gas drilling. And um, similar to what Frac Focus does, um, but this will also be publicly available information um, and it will also ensure that no PFAPs are being used moving forward. Um, as an update, the, we are getting ready to beta test the manufacturer's forms. So this would be um, companies that produce the chemicals that, that go into it. That information will then be kept in a chemical disclosure list um, and then that chemical disclosure list will be what we can provide to the state legislature as well as be publicly available. And then the second form, which is still being built, um, is actually what's filed by the operators that say we use these manufacturers' products in it. And then with each well, they'll be able to go onto our website and say, this well is close to where I live. These are the chemicals that are used in it. Um, but by way of an, again, by way of an update, just so everyone, everyone knows, um, we're getting ready to beta test that that first form, um, and it should hopefully be ready to go in the next week or two. Excellent. Um, any questions for Commissioner Cross from the commission? Great. Thanks for doing that, Mike. Appreciate that you've been assigned and are following through with that. Very important. Point Happy to do so, this. and thank you to OIT for the, the hard work as well and getting the forms ready, and also to Greg Duranlo for helping on staff as well as Arthur Cospell, who's taking a leading role in it. Excellent. Any other commissioner comments? Commissioner Ackerman? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the opportunity. I just wanted to give a brief geothermal update, um, among other things. As the commission knows, Senate Bill 285 established us as the, the Energy and Carbon Management Commission and moved geothermal energy largely into our regulatory authority. 
And so we've been working to finalize a geothermal MOU with DWR. And I want to recognize Ben Boudreau from the Attorney General's office and Mike Rigby for working hard on that and among others, and we should have that finalized soon. Uh, the Western Governors Association is in town. That's the uh, kind of the coalition of the governors of 22 Western states and territories. And they're up in Boulder this week. And Governor Bolas, Polis happens to be the uh, current chair of that association. And the current chair initiative is the Heat Beneath Our Feet initiative, which examines opportunities for and barriers to the increased deployment of geothermal energy technology for uh, both electricity generation and heating and cooling systems in the Western states which contain the vast majority of high yield geothermal energy capacity in the United States. So there was a lot more info, including um, an excellent Heat Beneath Our Feet initiative report on the uh, Western Governor's website, if others are interested in taking a look at that. Uh, during the past two days, Director Murphy and I have been up at the uh, WGA conference participating in geothermal sessions, and Director Murphy is still up there for the final day Today, we had a panel with industry and academia and the Deputy Secretary of Energy and several governors, uh, which uh, discussed the initiative. And uh, also we sat in on and participated in a roundtable discussion led by Governor Polis with a large room full of thought leaders to discuss thoughts, concerns, issues associated with the path forward on geothermal. And then the governor, Director Murphy, I and the go governor's office and others from our staff and the Colorado Energy Office met with the delegation from Alberta, who passed geothermal legislation and associated regulations just recently in 2022, and it was a very insightful discussion with them and we intend to have continued coordination and communication with, with them going forward. And I just want to thank, uh, especially from staff Mike Rigby, uh, Bryce Carter and Will Tour from the, the uh, Colorado Energy Office, Mark Silberg, and of course the governor, for working very hard, um, even outside of this legislation, through this initiative and other avenues to establish the foundation for geothermal moving forward in Colorado. It's a very exciting uh, time for geothermal and we're looking forward to making progress uh, in the future. Oh, and you're muted, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Ackerman. Um, appreciate the update and also want to recognize that uh, this is uh, truly uh, a you know wonderful opportunity that the state of Colorado has in terms of being able to utilize the professional commission that we have now as we move into these new areas as the Energy and Carbon Management Commission. And I appreciate your leadership on that front with regard to geothermal and really happy you were able to participate in that front. Other commissioners with comments? All right, let's try take two with Mr. Leonard. Hey, Mike, can you hear us? Need to unmute your cell phone unmute. all right there we go great we can hear you mr leonard all right thank you um I'm getting some feedback here for some reason this is working both through my can you hear me yeah, mike I, I think you want to disconnect your your computer and just go with the cell phone perhaps and I say that because I see two Mike Leonard's on the screen. One is an 0130 Mike Leonard, and another is just a computer Mike Leonard. Mr. Chair, I think he's got to hit star six on his cell phone in order to unmute it. Did you hear that, Mike? I did, but it's it's making me unmute my computer as well. Um, let me Let me leave the meeting, and I'll just stay on the phone. That's perfect. Well, we once had two Mike Leonard's and now we have none. Uh, just give us about, oh, here we go. Well, no. This is a different number. 9686. Ms. Larson, why don't we go ahead and move into our agenda and at least oh, get. Uh, looks like he's back. Let's try this one more time. I hope the internet's better now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, thank you. I don't know what's going on. It's been one of those weeks. Um, let me start over again. The, the, the Spring Creek fire started on Sunday. Uh, they thought they had it knocked down and then it flared back up on Monday. It's currently just under uh, 3,000 acres. We have been in contact with 
uh, Division of Fire Prevention and Control. Uh, David Gates, uh, our GIS specialist, has been working with them, working on some maps, because uh, there are oil and gas assets within the fire perimeter. I have talked to the, the operator. All of the wells have been shut in remotely. Uh, however, the operator hasn't been able to get in because it's a, a restricted area. Um, I do have, if you want to see a map from, where is it here? Um, that's not it. There's a map from uh, uh, Avalanche and Fire, Colorado State map that shows shows the, uh, you know, let me just share this one with you, if I may. Can you all see that? Yes. So Battlement Mesa is up in this area. Um, the fire started just off of I-70 down in here. Um, it's, it's traveled basically east. Um, as it as it travels east, it travels out of oil and gas areas. Should the fire take a turn to the north, um, that that will be a bigger impact. But again, we are working with Division of Fire Prevention and Control. As soon as the uh, the Type Two Federal team is established, they're supposed to be in there today. Uh, we will liaison with them as well and and help them out as much as we can. So uh, thanks for the update, Mr. Leonard. Um, but at this point, uh, things are under control relative to uh, oil and gas facilities. And who is the operator that's involved? Um, the majority of it is Karis. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they were in contact with me early Monday morning when the, when the fire uh, started back up. So uh, again, uh, remote shut-ins. We're not getting any reports from fire services of, of damage to oil and gas facilities, but you know they're pretty busy in there as, as it is. Um, and I'm, I know they're using the, the lease roads and the access roads to access this fire. And so an inquiring member of the public might want to know what happens when a fire crosses something that is remotely shut in? So the, the wellhead itself, the, the well itself is shut in. There's there's no product moving to the tanks. Um, uh, usually, and, and, and I say usually, I said 99.9% .9 of the time when we have wildfires in these areas, the fire burns right around the locations. Because of our rules to, to keep locations weed free and debris free and, um, you know, there's a buffer there. Um, I, I will say that in La Plata County, they have a, um, a, a process where they work with their wildland firefighters, they actually use oil and gas locations as staging areas because they are, um, they are clean, um, nothing really to burn. Okay. Awesome. Uh, other questions from commissioners for Mr. Leonard? Commissioner Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Mr. Leonard, for the update. I also just wanted to confirm that um, the employees of the operators, as far as you know, are all safe and sound homes yes. and, and work as yeah. well. Yeah, yes, they are. Every, everybody was out of there. Um, I, I don't know about public evacuations. I have heard that there's been some public evacuations on the on the one side of the fire, but um, all of the oil and gas um, uh, personnel are out and just waiting for that perimeter. Um, you know, once they get some more containment. I believe that they'd start back in probably on the on the the initial side of the fire, depending on which way it's going to run. Hopefully, we'll get some good weather over the next couple of days, and it will help us. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Leonard. Do appreciate your being in attendance and providing an update to us as well as all the interested stakeholders that are listening in. There's 59 some odd stakeholders. So. Um, with that, we'll let you return to your work, and thanks again. We now will turn to a consent agenda. Uh, does anyone have questions with regard to consent? Does anyone desire to make a motion concerning consent agenda? We move to approve the consent agenda. Second. 
Motion from Commissioner Cross, second from Commissioner McGowan to approve consent agenda. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Consent agenda is approved. We now move to docket 2201-00009. This is an oil and gas development plan application by Petro Operating Company. Uh, it's called the LG Everest OGDP. And uh, we will hear an order uh, of presentation from Mr. Maxey or his designee from the director of the local government designee from Well County, uh, followed by a presentation by Petro and then commissioner questions and deliberations. Mr. Maxey, you are recognized. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Robbins, and uh, good morning to the rest of the commission as well and staff. Um, thank you for a few minutes to be on your meeting and just say a few words about this LG Everest uh, OGDP that is in front of you. Uh, apologies for last week and uh, being on another meeting, but I'm very happy and thankful for my staff member, Kelly Holiday, who was able to get on and, and back me up as a teammate. So thank you for her uh, comments last week. Um, Commissioners, my comments today are going to be very brief regarding this OGDP uh, because as my 2A comments that were made back in September of 2022 reference, this location is fully within the municipal boundaries of the city of Fort Lepton. But I did want to take just a couple minutes to get on here and reference those comments um, and uh, uh, say that there was a little bit of question uh, regarding the layout of the facility and if it was fully within the boundary of the city of Fort Lupton and in their jurisdiction, um, worked uh, hand in hand with uh, Todd Hodges and Clay down in uh, Fort Lupton, uh, worked with Sabrina Trask, um, and I appreciate the dialogue between the three entities to make that confirmation, and I appreciate uh, Sabrina's help in sending uh, a couple of updated maps to both myself and to Fort Lupton so that we could confirm that. Um, so her help was instrumental in just reviewing uh, where this uh, location was, um, since there are some interesting and unique property boundaries uh, in the area. Uh, but it is fully within the boundaries of Fort Lupton. I just wanted to come out here and uh, uh, make sure that everybody knew about that uh, formally, and also just uh, in front of the commission say thank you again for uh, Sabrina's help and the coordination between both her and the city of Fort Lupton. So uh, with that being said, we have no concerns with this permit, um, we would uh, recommend approval for, uh, you know, the uh, the perception or the the, the stance from the uh, proximate local government standpoint. So thank you very much. Great. Uh, any questions for the proximate local government representative, Mr. Maxey? All right, uh, we'll let you go. And I know how to get a hold of you in case we have questions that come up during the presentation. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Have a great day. We now will recognize Joe Prashala. Great, thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and Commissioners, Director Murphy and staff. My name is Joe Prashala with Wellborn Sullivan Mech and Tooley, and I represent Petro Operating. I'm pleased this morning to present the LG Everest Oil and Gas Development Plan. And before I begin, I'd like to thank staff uh, for all of their hard work on this application as it's uh, been uh, quite the journey here, but we're here and, and uh, appreciative of the opportunity to present. And I'd also like to thank Mr. Maxey for his comments and support. Presenting today for Petro are Roger Parker, Manager for Petro Operating Company, Jessica Donahue, Compliance and Permitting Specialist with Ardor Environmental, and also available to answer questions is Alex Corey, Contract Operations Manager for Petro. Petro's application requests that the commission approve an oil and gas development plan that covers approximately 640 acres within Township 2 North, Range 66 West in Weld County, Colorado. The proposed development is planned from one oil and gas location with a total of 12 horizontal wells from the, L the proposed LG Everest pad. This location was selected following a thorough alternative location analysis, evaluating the entire area that surrounds this location for all potential sites and with two locations fully evaluated as technically feasible alternatives. The location is within the mineral development area. It's located on fee surface and uniquely it's within an active sand and gravel operations area. And as Mr. Maxey pointed out, entirely within the municipal boundaries of Fort Lupton. It's near the boundary with unincorporated Weld County. Fort Lupton is the relevant local government 
which has conditionally approved the permit for the LG Everest pad, and it will issue its final approval following the commission's approval of this OGDP here today. As you heard from Mr. Maxey, Weld County is the proximate local government and does support this LG Everest OGDP. With respect to leasehold, Petro owns leasehold covering more than 45% of the mineral interest in the proposed drilling and spacing unit, and therefore has the right to develop. Petro has requested approval of a companion Will 305 drilling and spacing unit application, which requests the commission establish an approximate 640 acre drilling and spacing unit covering the west half of sections 19 and 30, with 12 horizontal wells to produce oil and gas from the Niobrara, Fort Hayes, Codell, and Carlisle formations. Petro maintains that the proposed spacing unit and the boundary setbacks satisfy, excuse me, Rule 305B and the Conservation Act, including the protection of Corella rights. With the respect to the location, the LG Everest pad, as I noted, is on fee surface, and Petro has a surface use agreement with the surface owner. The pad will be used to develop the 640-acre drilling and spacing unit with 12 horizontal wells. And as I mentioned, Petro has considered all potential locations in the vicinity of this DSU, and you'll hear more about this uh, in Ms. Donahue's pre presentation, where they have evaluated two technically feasible alternatives. This pad is the best of the alternatives. The location is going to be constructed on an existing oil and gas location with no new surface disturbance, which captures the spirit of Rule 603D and E, which encourage operators to use existing locations where feasible and consolidate wells on that location. And again, this pad is within an active sand and gravel operation area. There are four residential building units within 2,000 feet of the working pad surface of this location. However, these own, the owners and the tenants have signed informed consent, which satisfies Rule 604B1. Therefore, the commission's review is pursuant to Rule 301A, and a can and should accept the findings of the commission staff as set forth in the director's recommendation for approval of the LG Everest pad. As you will hear, Petro's suite of best management practices at this location satisfies Rule 301A, such that the proposed operations will protect and minimize adverse impacts to public health, safety, welfare, the environment, and wildlife resources. And it will protect against adverse environmental impacts to air, water, soil, and biological resources. The best management practices, the highlights include electrified production equipment, oil and gas pipeline takeaway, a tankless design with no hydrocarbon storage on site, water delivery pipeline for completions operations, quiet frack fleet, sound walls during drilling and completions, group two mud with odor armor, extensive stormwater controls, anchored tanks and separation equipment, remote monitoring shutting capability, and air monitoring in compliance with AQCC Reg 7. With regard to wildlife, the location is within mapped high priority habitat. However, CPW determined that the active sand and gravel operations have entirely removed that habitat and waived all compensatory mitigation fees. With respect to notice, Petro has given notice pursuant to rules 504A and 303E1, no petitions or interventions were received. And on June 8th, 2023, the director issued a director recommendation which does recommend approval of the LG Everest OGDP. This application satisfies the Conservation Act and commission rules, specifically rule 604B1 and rule 301A, with a carefully selected location and best management practices to best protect and minimize adverse impacts to the public health, safety, welfare, environment, and wildlife resources. Petro respectfully requests that the commission adopt the director's recommendation and approve this application. And with that, if you just bear with me one moment as I share my screen to begin Petro's presentation, I'll have introductory comments from Mr. Roger Parker, followed by the presentation with Ms. Donahue. And while you get your screen share up, let's go ahead and recognize AAG Mercer to swear in the witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, and all of the witnesses for um, Petro Share, if you could turn on your camera, um, I'll ask you to just um, one by one raise your hand, state your name, and that you swear to tell the truth. I'll start with Ms. Donahue. 
Good morning. My name is Jessica Donahue, and I swear to tell the truth. Thank you. Um, Roger, sorry, I'm not seeing your last name. <laughs> uh, yes, hi, my name is Roger Parker, and I swear to tell the truth. Thank you. Mr. Corey? Hi, my name is Alex Corey, and I, oh, sorry. Uh, and I swear to tell the truth. Thank you very much. All right, we now will return to Mr. Prashala for screen sharing. We see the screen uh, up and running. Uh, I believe we are going to hear from Ms. or Mr. Uh, Parker first. Is that right? Yes, yes. Uh, good morning. Again, my name is Roger Parker. I'm a partner and manager of Petro Operating Company. I'd like to thank everyone at the commission for their hard work and effort on this application. Uh, a little bit about Petro Operating Company. It was formed on July 17, 2013. The owners and managers of Petro have operated in numerous basins across the country and at various periods in the Denver Julesburg and Peons basins in Colorado for over 39 years with initial drilling activity in May of 1984. Petro became an operator, uh, Colorado operator on August 18, 2015. We currently operate entirely in the Den Denver Julesburg Basin. We operate 42 wells, 38 of which are horizontal wells that have been drilled since 2018. We also participate in non-operated wells in the DJ Basin and have ownership in 141 wells operated by other companies. Petro has worked effectively with local governments to appropriately site locations, including two memorandums of understanding with the city of Brighton and successful efforts with the city of Aurora City Council in obtaining amended surface use agreements and pipeline easement agreements. Under the current 700 rules, Petro is an option one operator. Thank you again for your time this morning. We appreciate it. All right, Ms. Donahue. Good morning, everybody. Petro Operating is excited to share the LG Everest project with you today. The LG Everest location had, um, has received its director's recommendation of approval. This project has gone through several years of planning and the Petro team feels that the project we are presenting this morning protects public health, safety, welfare, and the environment to the greatest extent possible while still allowing for efficient mineral access. The LG Everest OGDP is a single location OGDP that will be entirely utilizing existing oil and gas disturbance. The existing location currently has one vertical well on it, the counter 1AD. The location is within the LG Everest sand and gravel operations. The photo on this slide shows the location and surrounding area. The oil and gas facility is located in the northwest northwest of section 30, township 2 north, range 66 west. The nearby crossroads are Weld County Road 18 and County Road 25. The relevant local government authority is the city of Fort Lupton. Fort Lupton does oversee oil and gas siting and the proximate local government is Weld County as you've heard this morning. The project proposes to expand an existing drilling and spacing unit to um, contain 640 acres and the LG Everest pad is located within that DSU there will be no new disturbance for the location. Petro Operating is proposing to drill 12 horizontal wells from the LG Everest location. This will efficiently access the minerals in the proposed DSU while minimizing surface disturbance. There are no school facilities, high occupancy building units, or any designated outside activity areas within 2,000 feet. There are four residential building units within 2,000 feet of the location, all four RBUs have provided informed consent. So just to give you a project timeline, Petra Operating began developing this project several years ago. They sought out a drilling and spacing unit of 480 acres back in 2018. Upon approval of that DSU, they worked with Fort Lupton for the local government permit and the floodplain permit. Provisional approval was granted by the City of Fort Lupton Council in 2020. Petro Operating anticipates final approval from Fort Lupton once the COGCC permits are approved. During this time and continuing into 2021, 
Petro has held numerous meetings with the surface owners to obtain their surface use agreements, construction easements, and the pipeline easements. In 2021, Petro met with the surrounding RBU owners, who are also the tenants, and obtained informed consent from all parties. Petro initially filed this OGDP in January of 2022. Petro worked with staff throughout 2022 to achieve completeness and amalgamate the application that presented before you today. The LG Everest had a 30-day public comment period. No comments were received during that time, nor were any petitions filed during the petition filing period for the hearing application. Staff issued the director's recommendation on June 8, 2023. So as I mentioned before, um, Petro Operating engaged early with the city of Fort Lupton. They submitted their application in 2019. At a city council meeting on January 7, 2020, the council provisionally approved the LG Everest and Fort Lupton will issue their final approval once after COGCC's approval of the OGDP. So the LG Everest location is within 2,000 feet from four RBUs. And while the LG Everest itself is not within a disproportionately impacted community block, some of the RBUs are located within a DIC. The location is also within the boundaries of a floodplain. In accordance with Rule 304B2B, Ruminet 1, 5, and 10, Petro prepared an alternative location analysis. In addition to the LG Everest location, Petro identified two viable alternative locations that were evaluated. As shown on this map, north is to your left. The hazards of proposing a stand-up was it didn't fit as conveniently on the slide. Here you can see the preferred location, LG Everest in the center and outlined in red. The two alter identified alternative locations are outlined in blue. The first alternate location is also located within LG Everest's um, active sand and gravel operations, just south of the pre preferred and proposed LG Everest pad. Alternative number one is closer to the Big Thompson River and at a lower elevation, which presents a potential environmental risk. The surface owner and the surface lessee also indicated to Petro oper operating that they have future usages for the surface that could be hindered by locating an oil and gas pad in this location, making this location less desirable for all parties. And there is also one RBU within 2,000 feet of alternative one. Alternative two would require new disturbance it is located within a DIC. There are five RBUs that are within 2,000 feet of the location. And the location would be approximately 292 feet from the Platte Valley Canal, which would be, of course, an environmental concern being that close to a surface water. The preferred location, the LG Everest pad, is located entirely within oil and gas disturbance. No new disturbance is proposed for the pad or the access road. The proposed pad is, or preferred pad, is located within the active LG Ever sand and gravel operations. There are four RBUs within 2,000 feet, but they have all provided informed consent. Petro has a surface use agreement with the surface owner, as well as an agreement with the surface lessee for this location. The natural gas and crude oil pipelines are already contracted, expediting this location's connection into infrastructure upon drilling and completions. This location allows for 12 wells to be drilled to access the entire mineral development area. The LG Evers pad is located within a floodplain polygon. Petro engaged with an engineering firm to evaluate the location prior to submitting its OGDP. This map shows the areas at risk for flooding. The darker the blue, the greater the potential and the depth for flooding. As you can see outlined in green is the proposed LG Everest location. The northern half of the location is estimated to be a minimal risk with no more than two potential feet of flooding. The southern half of the location is shown to have no flooding risk, hence Petro has proposed all production equipment to be installed on the southern half of the location to further mitigate any potential flood risk. Petro has designed the LG Everest location to be compliant with Rule 421, including remote shutting capabilities and anchoring tanks and separators in place. <clears throat> The LG Everest pad does fall within a polygon for designated mule deer migration corridor and mule deer severe winter range. 
Petro Operating consulted with CPW prior to its OGDP submittal. During the consultation in March of 2021, CPW determined that due to the existing active sand and gravel operation on the parcel surrounding the location, any potential habitat has already been removed, and this location does not in actuality qualify as high priority habitat. The director concurred with CPW's recommendation on May 3rd, 2023. Of course, Petro considered other locations in its alternative location analysis. Here's a map highlighting the mineral development area in black with the red boundary showing approximately the additional areas that were reviewed for potent other potential alternative locations. The preferred LG Everest location is shown as the blue star. Petro operating interacted with the parcel owners of the areas hatched in red. None of these landowners were willing to provide surface use agreements for potential locations. Yellow blocks represent residences and buildings. Other surrounding parcels were reviewed, but did not offer any options that would have been viable locations or more protective of public health and the environment than the locations that were chosen for the ALA. Petro operating. Oh, <laughs> oh I apologize. I think we, my slides are. So we can go to the next slide, Joe. Um, Petro Operating anticipates it will take approximately 11 days to prepare the existing location for drilling. Each well will take approximately eight days to drill. Once the wells are have been drilled prior to completion operations, Petro Operating will plug and abandon the existing counter 1AD well that is on the location. After the counter well has been plugged and abandoned, completion operations are anticipated to be approximately 15 weeks for the proposed wells. The wells are estimated to be on production by early 2024. Petro Operating is proposing to use entirely existing oil and gas location or disturbance. There is currently one vertical well on the pad, the counter 1AD. Petro intends to plug and abandon this well once the LG Everest wells have been drilled. When the OGDP was submitted, the LG Everest was being proposed as an amendment to the existing location. During the OGDP evaluation, it was determined to be more efficient that in lieu of amending the existing location, it would be best to bifurcate the legacy well and the lo legacy location from the proposed LG Everest project. If this OGDP is approved, the LG Everest will be assigned a new location ID and everything associated with the existing counter 1AD location, including the well, the off location flow line and tank battery location to the north will be decommissioned. The counter 1AD currently holds the lease that the LG Everest wells are targeting for mineral development, precluding the ability to plug and abandon the well prior to drilling the new wells. In the director's recommendation, there is a recommended condition of approval that Petro will PNA the counter 1AD, the DITE 1A, and the DITE number 2. The DITE number 2 was plugged and abandoned on May 25th, 2023. As mentioned earlier, the counter 1AD and the DITE 1A will be plugged and abandoned prior to completion operations commencing for the LG Everest wells. Petro Operating has designed its operations with several best management practices to go above and beyond to protect the public health, safety, welfare, and the environment. Petro did consult with CDPHE regarding this location in September 2022, and we just wanted to point out a few highlights of the BMPs that Petro has committed to. Petro will have an ambient air quality monitoring on location as per AQCC Regulation 7. Petro will utilize temporary surface pipelines to deliver water to the location for completion operations in order to minimize water hauling. Petro already has natural gas and oil takeaway pipeline contracts in place. Petro intends to electrify their production equipment. They did evaluate the potential to electrify drilling operations, but could not commit to it with the load requirements on the local utility and the availability of electric drilling rigs. They also evaluated using tier four drilling rigs. At this time with the drilling rigs available to them, they cannot commit to utilizing tier four engines. Petro will defer all routine non-essential activities on the high ozone days. The pipeline contracts that are in place allow Petro to commit to no hydrocarbon storage on site. Petro will have tanks on location for use in maintenance activities and potential upset conditions 
but they will not be used for daily storage. And the tanks will also be low profile tanks. During the OGDP process, Petro secured an additional lease and proposed to expand the existing 480 acre DSU to incorporate the additional 160 acres into the LG Everest project to maximize efficient mineral access. This led to proposing longer well bores. Petro evaluated the potential impacts this might have on the air emissions and determined that additional time for the combined drilling and completion operations for each well would be approximately 14 hours, a very de minimis change to the estimated emissions. Therefore, Petro did not have any changes to the emission estimates reported on the Form 2B. Petro will utilize Group 2 OBM with odor armor. The utilization of odor armor in group two has reduced the characteristics and intensity of the OBM by 90 to 95%. Group two mud has an aromatic content of 0.05 to 5%. Group three mud has an aromatic content of less than 0.5%. With the odor armor mixed into the group two mud, even if it's only 90% effective, that conservatively brings the aromatic content down to 0.5%, the same as a group three mud. The location is over a thousand feet from the nearest RBU and located within the active sand and gravel mine. Odor is not anticipated to be a nuisance, especially when coupled with the additional BMP of being stored in closed upright tanks when not in use. All cuttings will be removed in covered trucks. OBM not being used will be stored in closed tanks, as I mentioned. Cuttings will be regularly removed for disposal to minimize their time on location and drill pipe will be wiped down as it exits the wellbore to remove excess fluids. To protect water quality, Petro has committed to um, not using pits at the location and they will use a closed loop drilling system. Stormwater management controls will be in place around the location during site preparation. Weekly stormwater inspections will occur at the site until it is stabilized. Petro will use freshwater only for dust mitigation. And of course, no PFAS will be used on location. Petro will construct sound walls around the location during drilling and completion operations to minimize any sound that could occur. Petro will utilize a quiet frack fleet for completion operations. Petro will also use task-oriented lighting and ensure that lighting is angled away from the surrounding buildings. Water delivery for completion operations will be via a temporary surface pipeline. And oil and natural gas pipelines are already contracted um, to be constructed and connect the location for takeaway capacity to minimize traffic to the location. So whenever rigs are on location, the crews will have daily safety meetings. And as mentioned, since the location is in a floodplain, all separators and tanks will be anchored in place. Um, Petro will use telemetry. They would have used telemetry whether it was in a floodplain or not, but they will ensure that the telemetry system is equipped with remote shut-in features for wells and production equipment. And one last BMP that we wanted to highlight was, since we are using the closed loop for loops system for drilling, cuttings will be removed regularly from location, and there will be no permanent waste storage on site. With that, I will turn it back over to Joe. Great, thank you, Jessica. Uh, I'd just like to uh, recap and just and request that the commission approve this application. Just note that this app that this location is really the best location uh, in this area. It's within an active sand and gravel operation. Uh, it utilizes an existing oil and gas location with no new disturbance. With respect to the receptors, the four RBUs, all of them have granted informed consent. And then as the BMPs that were described by Ms. Donahue, uh, we believe that this location and the operations do satisfy rule 301A and therefore respectfully request that the commission approve the LG Everest OGDP. Thank you. And we are available for questions. Thank you <clears throat> for the presentation. Uh, commissioners, uh, we now have the panel before us for Questions. Does anyone have questions? Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you for the presentation today. 
Um, I'll start off by saying that this this actually is a was a tough one for me to get through. I appreciated the use of an existing location and an location that had has already significant disturbance. I was a little concerned, am a little concerned um, at what was being proposed because it's in a non-attainment area. And although you have RBU owners that have signed consent, I'm, I am not sure that you have tried to first avoid, then minimize, then mitigate. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the type of engines you're going to use for drilling and completions and how you have tried to minimize emissions. And um, you know, if you're if you're you can't commit to electrification, which I understand many operators can't because of the load on the, the electric system. Um, many of our operators have then said they will use a tier four engine and or try to show equivalent emissions reductions that are equivalent to using a tier four engine. Um, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I'm getting that in this application. So I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Yes, Commissioner. <clears throat> Sorry. Yes, Commissioner, thank you for the question. We evaluated the project to, firstly, of course, avoid as many sensitive receptors as possible. That's why leveraging the existing oil and gas disturbance is appealing. That way there's no new disturbance, especially with the area having the river concerns and the floodplain and the high priority habitat and the migration corridors. So determining that we can move past from going on from avoidance and trying to minimize any impacts, Petro tried to incorporate as many elements as they could, such as making sure there's takeaway capacity for oil and natural gas to minimize truck traffic. They will, they want to use temporary surface lines to deliver water for completion operations to further minimize the truck traffic that would be coming in and out of the location. The electrification load is always a concern with drilling completion operations. It's very demanding on the local utilities, but they are going to incorporate electrification into their production equipment so that it will minimize those impacts as much as possible. As for the drilling rig engines, at this time, the tier four, I think as you've heard from other operators, tier four engines are becoming trickier to contract. And so the rigs that Petra has been working with to uh, obtain a contract with are not at a tier four designation at this time. They are working with their drilling contracts contractors to see what quality engine they can obtain um, to meet their drilling obligations because they do have contracts and things that need to be um, implemented in 2023. So they're doing the best they can with what is available to them on currently with their vendors. Okay. Um, so we, I, you know, we, I feel like we've had some kind of similar conversations with other operators and um, one of the solutions that another operator came up with was a fuel strategy and also use of battery to show a lower emissions profile that's closer to a tier four engine. And can you explain why or why not that would be possible in this situation? I don't wanna say it's impossible, but I am not 100% certain. So I don't want to commit Petro right now. Um, working in discussions with the individuals from Petro that are working on the drilling rig contracts. I think those are all items that they're discussing, but. I have not heard what has been a commitment and what is available to them right now at this time for what they've contracted. But I am I know they are looking to leverage the best technology that they can obtain and contract that's available to them. Oh, okay. 
Um, okay, sorry, I want to look at my questions. Um, for the drilling mud, I, I, I understand that a lot of folks when they present to us are talking about odor, but for me, it's also an emissions issue. Group three has a lower, also a lower emissions profile. You are near four RBUs within 2000 feet. You're in a non-attainment area. Um, want to know why you're proposing group two instead of group three because of not just odor, but emissions. Thank you for the question. The group two mud is much more readily available to operators. Group three is becoming a little trickier to obtain, but with that in mind, knowing the differences, not just in odor, but emissions between group two and group three, part of the, uh, the odor factor is why they're um, committing to mixing in the odor armor to help with that aspect of it. And as for the difference in emissions between a group two and a group three. I don't, I'm not as familiar with those numbers off the top of my head, um, but I know the, in discussions with Petro's drilling team, they are, they know they can obtain the group two and we'll take a look at what those emissions would be um, and to make sure that we have all the correct numbers when we do the uh, annual emissions inventory for CDPHE. So we'll have those numbers available at the time to be able to have a better informed emissions inventory on the impacts. Okay, um, thank you. I'm wondering if you could just clarify for me um, I think this well that that on the existing location that will be P and A'd has production equipment across I think across the pond, and I just want to clarify that that's also going to be P and A'd, and then that that will also include um, reclamation activity. I think for the other P and A'd wells, there wasn't reclamation because it's in the gravel pit area. There's nothing really to reclaim, but this disturbance seems to me like it does warrant reclamation. I just want to make sure that that's included and that we are talking about that. Yes, you are correct. The uh, counter one AD, so the wellhead shares this oil and gas disturbance that the LG Evers project is proposed upon, but there's an off location flow line and a production facility that is north of it, adjacent to County Road 18. And that will be decommissioned and rec fully reclaimed um, once this counter one AD well has been plugged and abandoned. And this was also one of the items that Petro wanted to implement in order to better streamline their processes by locating the production equipment for the LG Everest on the LG Everest pad. They can pull that production equipment and those tanks away from the county road, further away from the RBUs, and that way everything will be concentrated as far as possible from the RBUs. Okay, thank you. Um, then as, as part of the new setup, I think you said that you all will have four oil tanks on site on location for maintenance only. And I, I've asked this question of many operators. I think if we're really trying to show that we're going tankless, and in this case, when we talk about tankless, it's, um, I'm not sure that this fits the definition of tankless as we've been talking about it, but I would like to know if you could clarify why you need four oil tanks for just maintenance purposes. That seems a little overkill to me. And there's a difference between needing it for maintenance versus I want those tanks so I can keep producing and not have to shut in if something happens with the midstream takeaway, right? Uh, this is Alex Corey. Um, the the reason for the four tanks um, is, is really for the initial production when we start up. If we have an issue where, let's say, we the, the compression station or something along the, the, the midstream loses power, um, while they have power down, we can produce the tanks and then produce back out of, and the volumes we have at the initial part of the production phase, um, four tanks is about the number we found we need for that to give them the buffer, the midstream company, the buffer to get us back up and running. Um, usually as time progresses, 
that number will reduce and we'll end up reducing the number of tanks on location. So that's really why there's four. Okay. Um, I, I'm my final comment, and I'm I've been trying to think of a a way to say this without sounding. I'm really I'm concerned about some of the language that was in the form two Bs and in the cumulative impacts information that you all put forward, which kind of talked about a de minimis or negli negligible impact to people in the area because this gravel pit already exists. The, the problem with using that kind of language from my perspective as a commissioner is that this is already quite disturbing to people in that area. And I think maybe you already saw one of the commissioners ask for an enviro screen profile for that community. There's particulate matter issues, there's noise issues, there's air quality issues, and you are layering on top of that. And that is not a negligible, in my mind, impact to people living in that community. And I I have talked about this before, and I really hope that in the future we can use different language and recognize that these are impacts on communities that are already being impacted, and we're concerned about that, and that's why we talk about cumulative impacts and how they affect communities that are already being impacted by activities in their neighborhoods. And so I just would really urge folks to think about words that we use and why we use them and recognize what's happening in a community and the impacts to those communities. Um, I am done asking questions, thanks. Other questions for the panel? Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Commissioner McGowan, for um, asking some of the questions that I was also going to ask. Um, I do have a few follow up questions to those, but I wonder if we could take a second um, and I would. Um, I wonder if Commissioner Oath would be able to um, share a little bit of information about um, the Enviro screening report that was provided by CDPHE and 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 what what that says maybe do a little interpretation of that for for me as a commissioner would be helpful sure commissioner messner i'm happy to do that um first i just want to say really appreciate the interest in using enviro screen as a tool uh, as a screen tool just to provide some context and additional information for understanding this ogdp and others um kind of backing up a little bit um the the legislature revised the definition of disproportionately impacted community this session. There are a number of criteria that lead to an area being designated as a disproportionately impacted community. So that includes consideration of um, low income communities, communities of color, housing cost burden communities, linguistically isolated communities, for example, um, and then cumulative cumulatively impacted communities as well, right? So what you can see in um, our assessment and, and report is just looking at um, this location and the census block group that it is in does not, um, that census block group is not a disproportionately impacted community under any of, any of the prongs. Um, we thought it would be helpful to provide a little bit more context specifically about the cumulative impacts prong. So um, in the recent update, the legislature said that anything that's over the 80th percentile on the cumulative impacts score qualifies as a disproportionately impacted community. This census block group, uh, its percentile score for cumulative impacts is 79.1. So it's just below that threshold, but is below that threshold. So does not show up as a disproportionately impacted community. And then um, just kind of in terms of geographic understanding and context, um, just to, I think it's to the north um, at 837 feet to the north is um, another census block group. And that is does qualify as a disproportionately impacted community under a number of those prongs. Um, that I mentioned, including the cumulative impact score. So it scores um, 89 on the cumulative impacts score. Um, we did break out also in our report. So um, when we look at cumulative impacts, there are 35 indicators that go into that score. We've highlighted in our report a, 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 num a subset of those 35 indicators, the ones that are kind of more specifically related to oil and gas development. 
um, just to kind of help understand the, the relative context. That said, you know, I do think it's important to think kind of holistically of the, on the score as a whole um, when thinking about this, but did think that that would be a little bit helpful for context. Thank you, Commissioner Oath. That's super helpful. Um, I wonder, just a couple follow-up questions. So as I look at the, um, the Enviro screen report and I look at the, um, the indicators on there, um, you know, as I look at things like uh, understanding that the overall Enviro screen score is 79.1, but I look at air toxic submissions at 99.6, I look at you know, fine particle pollution at 94.8, uh, 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 wastewater discharge indicator 99.3, proximity to oil and gas 99.4, other air pollutants 99.2. Like, what does that say to you as far as, I mean, I understand, so I think I just heard you, it's important to look at it holistically, right, um, as far as determining cumulative impacts, but is there any, um, anything that I should be looking at as I evaluate this uh, OGDP utilizing this tool um, in those specific areas where it is in, you know, the high 90th percentiles? You know, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, and I don't know if I have a very straightforward answer other than, I guess, just to say, again, like, for, for me, as I think about it, and why I think pulling out, you know, highlighting and just ha having awareness about those specific indicators is because those are related to oil and gas development, right, and, and contributions to the overall score and kind of where that area is already um, and that this is, you know, the, that additional development means additional load and impact on, uh, on those types of indicators, you know, that there already is disproportionate impact on those indicators and, and it would be related to this type of development as well. Okay, thank you for that. I appreciate your input. Um, I did have a few questions that I wanted to follow up on and just make sure that I understand what's being proposed here. Um, so we've got 12, 12 wells. We're, we're on an existing oil and gas location and an active sand and gravel operation um, for RBUs. Uh, within 2,000 feet, uh, all RBU owners have um, created or have signed informed consent. Um, there is remote shut-in capabilities that are being proposed. Um, that wasn't clear to me, you know, in the BMPs uh, on the 2A. And so I wanted to just make sure that that was clear um, that, uh, um, that there also was the, um, commitment for electrification of production equipment, which was not clear again to me in the 2A or the BMPs that were um, incorporated in 2A. So I just wanted to confirm that and I could be missing it in there. Um, right now, the operator is proposing um, the utilization of tier two diesel um, drill rig. I heard that it is proposing the utilization of a, of a quiet frack fleet, but it's not clear to me the engine type that's being proposed in the in the in the frack fleet, and so I'm assuming that the engines that are being proposed are a tier two diesel engine frack fleet. But I wonder if someone could confirm or um, uh, inform me differently on that. Uh, we're working with uh, our our contractor there. Um, they do have tier four, and we're trying to get that, but it is currently deployed to a different part of the country. So. Assuming we can get the timing correct, we will try and get it here, but it's not necessarily going to be available. Uh, so what I'm hearing you say, because I, I, as a BMP, as a condition of approval associated with an application, it is either, it, it either you're going to do it or you're not going to do it. Um, and so at this point, you're not able to commit to a tier four. So I'm assuming that the utilization of a tier two is what's being proposed in this application. Is that correct? Commissioner Messner. Thank you for the question. It becomes tricky. There you go. I apologize for the echo. It's tricky sometimes with permitting and such because we, we don't want to overpromise. So we want to tell you what we know we can obtain 
but that doesn't mean that Petro will stop striving to obtain the better technology, the cleaner technology, the less impactful technology. We just, as Alex said, we want to contract a tier four engine quiet frack fleet, but it's in a different part of the country and we don't know if it'll be mobilized back to Colorado in time to align with the timing of operations that Petro is going to execute. Thank you, Ms. Donahue, for uh, the reply. I mean, I do understand that, and, um, but at the same time, you know, I'm evaluating an application based on whether or not it meets our rules and whether or not it's protective of public health, safety, welfare, the environment, wildlife resources. I have to be able to make a determination of that based on what you can commit to. Um, and so that's why I'm asking these questions to ensure that I understand what, um, what I'm approving or not approving in a particular application. So. Um, uh, I, I, I don't discount the fact that I'm sure that Petro will try to do everything that it can, but at the same time, I can only evaluate an application based on um, what an operator can commit to. So uh, I hope you understand that. Um, we do, and we appreciate the thoughtfulness that all the commissioners put into evaluating what we've offered to you. And we... That's why we did want to emphasize the BMPs that we know we are committing to, that we know we have the capability of executing, such as the electrification of the production equipment and the shorter duration of the drilling as um, efficiently as possible and uh, using closed loop systems and using green completions and items like that, things that we absolutely know 100% that we can commit to. We just also want to make sure you know that while we can't commit in writing right now to some of the things that we would like to have, we do want you to know that we are trying. It's not going to stop them from working with vendors to obtain the better engines and everything, as I mentioned. Thank you. Um, I, I want to talk just a little bit about, um, I guess, kind of the, the 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 later modification of this in order to, um, you know, expand the drilling and spacing unit and uh, and therefore expanding the the uh, horizontal reach of some of the wells that are being proposed um, and this thought that it wouldn't. In, increase or change the emissions profile associated with the information that was provided in the 2B. Um, so I did hear you, and I think what I heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you're anticipating that it would take about 14 additional hours per well to, um, to kind of expand the reach uh, of each of these 12 wells that are being proposed here. Did I understand that correctly? Yes, you did. Okay. So I'm not a math genius um, and I didn't do the math here, but I'm. it appears to me that that looks like about a week's of additional um, drilling associated with being able to hit those, you know, longer laterals. Um, and, you know, particularly with using a tier two, um, uh, diesel engine on the rig and the associated uh, increase in um, completions activities that would be associated with those longer reaches. Um, to me, that doesn't seem like uh, a negligible amount of potential emissions um, increases as associated with the calculations that were done in the form 2B. Um, and so I'm, I'm still, I guess I'm struggling with why not modify that in order to make sure that it's accurate because there is a you know a rule requirement and an expectation that the information that's provided in the two cumulative impacts of oil and gas activities um, is as accurate as an operator can anticipate it to be the Intent is always to provide the most accurate information that an operator can with permitting 
you uh, initially, uh, uh, um, in my experience, a lot of times the permits are far more conservative in their numbers to, again, kind of like I said, you don't over promise and you make sure that you're permitting a reasonable conservative estimate. Uh, the difference even now between what was submitted on the 2B and what is being prepared with the CDPHE construction permits and things like that, the emissions just between those two items are um, very different. So it becomes a delicate balance, I think, with how often do you revise a permit when you make these tweaks that would adjust it. So with the knowledge that the drilling and completions would only extend each well by 14 hours, which does in total add up to approximately seven days, the air emissions that we had at the time when we submitted the Form 2B, it was hundreds and thousands of decimal points, I think, to, of a difference between what was submitted and what it might be now. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, I wonder if we could pivot here a little bit. And um, I'm trying to better understand. So at least in the, the photos that I viewed of the location, um, the maps that have been provided uh, in the application, um, it appears to me that um, there's a significant amount of water that's in close proximity to the oil and gas location associated with the um, ongoing gravel operation that's occurring you know ar around this particular proposed location and um my understanding at least of that groundwater that's associated with uh ponds that um get created through gravel operations is that that groundwater is directly um, connected to, um, you know, aquifers and, and groundwater tables um, below ground. And so explain to me how the BMPs that you're proposing um, and the siting of the facility uh, utilizing the um, avoid, minimize, and mitigate criteria um, address uh, the potential impact to groundwater that, at least in what I'm reading, could be as shallow as five feet below surface, and certainly um, within close proximity to this location, um, with the with the gravel pit ponds, um, and and that close connectivity to um, potential drinking water aquifers. Thank you for the question. The uh, Some of the BMPs that Petro is going to make sure they implement, and of course, other pieces that are part of the rules, they will ensure that they have um, all, all fluids that are, they're trying to minimize all fluids that are stored on site, such as having the oil takeaway pipeline. They will have produced water tanks um, stored on site, but they will be within lined and steel burned containment. There will be weekly inspections to of the stormwater BMPs as well, and just having their field staff um, visually inspect the site to look for any kind of potential concerns that might be occurring around the fluid storage on location. And they will they are cognizant of the gravel ponds that are there. So they will be making sure that the perimeters of the location also have that tertiary berm to keep anything that could potentially occur on site and away from those gravel ponds. And so the tanks that are on there though, I mean, we do have um, hydrocarbon storage that's being anticipated on there, even at, uh, even if, contemplated for a short amount of time. We've got produced water tanks that are um, 
that are being proposed for the site on a permanent basis because there's no produced water takeaway from this particular location. Um, and understanding that I think the BMPs are proposing that all of these have uh, anchoring, um, that they have um, you know, tertiary containment and secondary containment, primary containment, um, you know, and these and, and all of these other pieces, but um, I guess I'm still concerned with the proximity to this and it being, you know, shallow groundwater um, that has the potential to be contaminated both from a potential spill and release, which it sounds like the BMPs that are being proposed could address that, but also a potential flood situation um, where those containment um, protocols may or may not be able to address um, a flood situation. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the a, a flood situation and what that looks like on site and how the VMPs that you're proposing would uh, eliminate any kind of migration of, of potential contamination from site to those gravel ponds in an event when you've got two potentially two feet of water on site. The siting of the location does create some interesting opportunities for operations. Um, part of the telemetry system will have tank sensors so that Petro can also monitor remotely what the fluid levels are in the site so that it will help in case of any kind of breach of the tank. But with the steel containment having 150% capability of the largest tank, and then you'll have your tertiary containment to keep everything else on site, that would addresses, of course, uh, general operations. I think with the floodplain situation, Petro is very sensitive to their situation and will monitor weather appropriately and uh, minimize the amount of fluids on location if the weather seems to be making a turn or um, it, in case it's coalescing into that kind of potential concern for a flood. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, stop for now. I appreciate the responses to my questions. Um, I may have a couple of additional questions, but I'll let other commissioners um, ask questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you, Commissioner McGowan and Commissioner Messner for your questions. Most of my questions were answered with that. Um, with respect to one of the questions that Commissioner Messner asked, could, could you repeat again the amount of emissions increased by the approximate week of extra drilling there for the extra step out? Don't have the numbers in front of me, but if I recall correctly, when we were taking a look at it, um, to see what the impacts would be, the differences were in the hundredths and potentially thousands of decimals um, between what was initially submitted with the 2B and uh, where we are currently calculating emissions estimates might be as we prepare the CDPHE permits. And is that for just CO2 emissions? Is that for NOx? Is that for everything or is that i uh, we were primarily looking i believe at co2 and nox um when we were looking at those emissions i just wanted to make sure that i, I had that correct um and then i, I want to talk about the water a little bit so mm -hmm. the flood plan is approved by fort lupton is that correct correct it was part of the um fort left an initial submittal. So they had their oil and gas location siting permit, and then they had their floodplain permit. Okay. And when you re when you talk to the RBU owners, and I believe, I'm going to go back, I, I want to say it was in 2021 that you were talking to the RBU owners. Is that when you received the informed consent was in 2021 as well? I believe so, yes. And when you spoke with the RBU owners, um, did you talk about 
flood issues? Did you talk about emissions issues? What, what kind of conversations did you have with them? I was not privy to those conversations. I may defer to Roger. He has better historical knowledge on the interactions with the RBUs. Yeah, I only spoke directly with one of the uh, one of the four RBU owners. Uh, one of our other representatives who is not on this call spoke with the other three. Um, the, the, the gentleman that I spoke with who is on the north west uh, part of the of the uh, DSU um, was primarily interested in how long we were going to be on location. Uh, he did not ask specific questions related to emissions or anything of that sort. He was presented the letter that was required to be presented by by the Oil and Gas Commission rules. Um, I spoke with him a couple of times uh, directly by phone, and uh, he was thankful and appreciative of the conversation uh, but did not get into detailed questions about emissions he was primarily interested in how long <clears throat> would it take us to drill and complete okay um thank you for that um as i said i think most of my other questions have been answered so i'll i'll save the rest of my comments for deliberations further questions commissioner ackerman Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be very brief as uh, I appreciate uh, Commissioner McGowan leading out on this and she uh, addressed many of the issues that I had here as well. I did want to say thank you to the operator for uh, working uh, within another industrial area, planning industrial use on another industrial use, I think is good practice where we can make that work. And so I appreciate you doing that. Um, can you touch a little bit on, I, I understand that the three existing wells, uh, if we're successful here, will be plugged and abandoned. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the uh, potential reclamation of those, uh, how much acreage is being restored, or is, is most of that within the also within the sand and gravel operation? And uh, do you have an expected emissions reduction associated with the plugging of those older wells? Thank you, Commissioner Ackerman, for the question. The three locations that will be plugged and abandoned are all within the sand and gravel. So the surface will be um, decommissioned as per COGCC rules, but then it will be turned over to LG Everest for their operations. So reclamation from where the wellheads are located will not be a um, habitat type restoration. Where the counter 1AD production facility is located adjacent to the road, that would be a traditional reclamation process. And so that acreage will be turned back over to um, reseeded, recontoured, and um, reclaimed. As for a reduction in emissions for plugging and abandoning the wells, I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. I apologize. The uh, They are three vertical wells. Um, they are currently um, of a vintage that um, have outlived their useful life. And so they will be plugged and abandoned. But as for quantitatively what those emissions might be, I'm not sure. Thank you for your responses. Um, I also wanted to just mention a couple of other things that have been mentioned by other commissioners just to ensure that I'm on the record also as having concerns with the uh, the uh, tankless BMP issue. Um, I haven't heard us, and I may have missed it here while I was taking notes, but I haven't heard us talk very much about uh, no produced water takeaway. It looks like you've got oil and gas takeaways. Uh, can you uh, elaborate a little bit on why uh, no produced water takeaway? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, at this time, there's currently no infrastructure in place to allow for produced water takeaway. It is an option that Petro is exploring, but they have not been able to commit to that at this time. Thank you. Do you know how far it is to the uh, closest tie-in for produced water takeaway? Off the top of our head, we don't know. Um, it's probably at least a few miles. All right, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, 
as Commissioner McGowan alluded to as well, I uh, my largest concern probably was associated with the ALA here. Again, I want to emphasize that I appreciate the proposed location being on an industrial area and uh, agree with that. Um, I appreciate the operator reaching out and acquiring informed consent from the impacted homeowners, but I would agree with Commissioner McGowan that they remain impacted and, uh, and, and additively so. I'm reading from the director's recommendation. It said that staff requested a more thorough ALA due to the limited number of alternatives originally presented and insufficient information in the original submittal. Petro submitted a new ALA that only had a more thorough description of the two alternative locations and did not present any other alternatives. And this is the part that concerned me. Although there are potential locations with lower impact that may have been considered, staff notes that due to the existing disturbance, and staff goes on to say that of the uh, of the uh, proposed locations, that the proposed location is uh, you know less impactful. Um, you mentioned uh, other surface owners and other uh, locations um, that you know weren't, weren't willing to have surface location agreements. Uh, in your opinion, were there other locations that you took a look at that you did not include in the ALA that could have been included in the ALA? Thank you for the question. The um, when we were take we did discuss with staff the contents of the ALA, and when they did express their concerns regarding the information provided, we took a a harder look at the surrounding thing locations and surface, um, but there are still, are, there are still residential building units. There's the Eastern half is very dominated by water. So anything along the Eastern parcels would have been much closer to the river, much deeper into the floodplain and raised several other environmental concerns that Petro did not want to potentially have impacts on. And then along the Western half, when we were looking at that for other potential alternatives with the surface owners that were contacted by Petro that denied even a hypothetical alternative location. And with the residential building units that were located alongside the West side, we just, couldn't identify something that would be more protective of the surrounding landscape and the floodplain and the waters and the wildlife habitat than the sand and gravel location that we preferred. The, sec the first alternative that was still within the sand and gravel so that we minimized our impact on the wildlife habitat and the second alternative that we identified, but that would have brought us closer to the canal. So it was a tricky evaluation to try to bring anything. We didn't want to just throw, we didn't want to play the spaghetti game and just throw spots on a map. We wanted to make sure that if we were presenting alternatives to the commission, that they were genuinely viable options that Petro could explore. And everything else that we looked at were either more impactful or it's we may have moved further from this resource but now we're closer and we're creating new disturbance in the habit wildlife habitat or we're getting closer to a residence or we're closer to surface water and it was a very delicate balancing game to make sure that we optimized our protection of public health safety welfare and the environment and proposed technically feasible and viable. Looks like we may have lost Ms. Donahue. We may have lost Ms. Donahue. Mr. Prashala, do you have access to her? Yeah. Oh, there she is. I think I she think may be back. back. Yeah, she froze there for a moment. Jessica, you froze. Oh, did I? Okay. I, I do have one other comment to make related to this. Um, Go ahead, Mr. Parker. The, the other potential locations were primarily to the north of the, uh, of the outlined DSU. We made numerous attempts to contact other surface owners who simply would not engage in conversation with us. 
So we didn't, it wasn't that we, um, uh, they didn't even give us the opportunity to say no to us. Thank you, Mr. Parker. You addressed my uh, pending follow-up question. I appreciate that very much. And thank you, Ms. Donahue. Um, I guess finally, uh, I think a pretty simple question, but uh, it looks like Fort Lupton has provided conditional uh, approval. I'm presuming that that conditional is simply based upon approval by this commission and that there aren't other conditions or concerns that Fort Lupton has um, or is waiting on for uh, approval of their side of this. Correct. They are just waiting on COGCC approval before they'll issue their final approval. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't have any further questions at this point. Okay. Uh, any other questions at this point? All right. I'm seeing no further questions. Um, what I'd like to do is take a break and I want to provide some perspective to the applicant because I'm looking for a closing argument from the applicant. Uh, we've heard questions from commissioners relative to concerns around failure to avoid first, then minimize and mitigate, questions around emissions, questions around the EnviroScreen tool, uh, concerns about the location within a floodplain and impacts to groundwater, and questions around cumulative impacts and perhaps the 2B not being updated correctly versus Ms. Donahue's percentage point arguments. Weighing against that, uh, we have informed consent from the four RBU owners. We have no one that has objected to this location, period. We've got the proximate local government that is in favor of it. We've got Fort Lupton that is in favor of it. We've got Fort Lupton that is, is in charge of floodplain concerns, and they've identified a floodplain situation. Uh, we've got the commitments from the operator to do uh, a slew of BMPs, while not all of the BMPs that all the operators have done. So there's like competing categories going on here. I'd like to take about a 20 minute break, return at 1056. And I'd like to hear from Mr. Pashala and his team to sort of sum up kind of what it is the commissioners are looking at, given that this is not slam dunk one way or another. Thank you, we'll return at 1056. At this point, the recording has started again, so we are able to move forward uh, with consideration of the docket before us. Uh, Mr. Pashala, I tried to give you some time to sort of gather your and your clients' thoughts, uh, a lot of, of uh, questions from commissioners. Um, are you prepared to be able to sort of summarize kind of where you and your client are with regard to the OGDP at this point in time? Yes, I believe so. Uh, and I appreciate your comments, uh, Chair Robbins, and uh, giving us an opportunity to uh, respond to some of the commissioner questions and thoughts here. Um, I think you are right that there is um, a balance that needs to be struck, and there's always a balance that needs to be struck uh, associated with oil and gas development and its impacts on the community. Uh, I think from a the starting place, as Commissioner Mesner has pointed out, was avoidance. And we had put up the slide, and I can pull it up again if it would be helpful, that it was not just, the ALA was not just two locations. It wasn't just two alternatives. They had, Petro Operating had looked at areas all, all within the DSU, all are technically feasible uh, locations outside of that DSU. And as you could see from the slide was that there are significant water resources that uh, around the area that essentially put off limits anything to the east of the DSU. Uh, all of this area is generally in a floodplain. So these, these issues with respect to the floodplain are gonna exist no matter where a location is sited uh, with respect to these minerals. Uh, and as Mr. Parker had pointed out, it wasn't as though Petro made no effort to communicate with other surface owners. In fact, those other surface owners would not even open up uh, a discussion about alternatives. So, so the op options here are quite limited as to uh, where a site could be uh, to develop these minerals. 
I think with respect to that floodplain, it's important to note that the tanks are going, that all equipment is going to be anchored, that in the, in the event of a flooding event, that this equipment will be anchored. Uh, I, I think operators have obviously learned their lessons from the 2013 uh, flood event uh, that, we're, that we all remember. Uh, there's telemetry in place. That will signify in advance to, and based on weather, incoming weather reports, will tell Petro if there's a potential event, allow them to get out there and empty and unload any produced water, any, and as we've noticed before, there's not going to be stored hydrocarbons on this location. So there's that BMP is huge for avoiding and mitigating impacts associated with the floodplain. There's also the steel containment, uh, which as we discussed is 150% capacity of the largest tank in the event of a catastrophic, catastrophic failure. We do not anticipate, and I don't think uh, anyone here is anticipating a catastrophic failure of a, of a tank, but with that and combined that steel, <clears throat> that steel containment, and also as required by rule, the impervious liner under the location, there are adequate best management practices in place that are protective of groundwater. We'd also just note that the, the holding of any produced water is regularly scheduled to be, to be unloaded. It's not as though that this is, there's going to be large quantities of produced water stored on the site uh, for long periods of time. I also wanted to just talk about minimizing on emissions. And there's a lot of discussion about engines, tiered engines. And, We've, commissioners, you're, you are familiar with this, that there is technology that is out there, but it is not always available to operators uh, on the basis that we otherwise would like. While Petro cannot commit to tier four engines right now, it certainly reaffirms its commitment to utilizing that technology to the extent that it becomes available. And as we, we've heard today that, unfortunately, the frac crew with the tier four engine is not, the frac equipment is, is just simply not in the state of Colorado right now. And Petro has contractual commitments to work with this frac provider. It's not as though they can just walk away and go and find another uh, frac equipment out there that might be better. They, they're under contractual obligations to work with this provider. And this provider has, uh, has informed them that the the equipment tier four engines are not even in the state of Colorado at this time. And there's no guarantee that they're gonna be here by the time that Petro needs to execute on its contractual commitments to develop. If that's available, it will certainly use that equipment uh, at that time. Now, that being said, I think it's important to remember that a lot of these emissions that, that uh, have been raised are during the drilling and completions phase. And that, after that point, this site is going to be electrified. The emissions drop off precipitously at that point and are not a long-term contribution to this area. The, the length, the extended length of the lateral wells, yes, do slightly a nominal increase of emissions uh, as explained by Ms. Donahue in the hundreds, if not the thousands of percentile but again, it's limited in duration. It's only for the drilling and completions stage. It's not going to be a long-term impact. I'd also like to just bring up this, the Enviro screen. I think it's important to remember that, as we heard, this location is below the 80% overall score threshold. And again, most of the emissions as identified in then on bio screen are associated with diesel engines, which would only again be used during the drilling completion phase. Long term, this is going to be an electrified site. Those emissions go away. There will not be a significant contribution to particulate emissions from this location. I do want to go back again to the alternative location analysis that there really is no other location that's technically feasible and viable to access these minerals that would not have similar or greater impacts to public health, safety, welfare, and the environment. Just adding alternatives to the ALA analysis 
by picking some sites that we know aren't even feasible does not change that ultimate analysis that this LG Everest location within an existing industrial site and on an existing oil and gas location is the best site. And I think it's really important that we don't lose sight of the fact that Fort Lupton is the relevant local government, has been engaged in this process, has all but approved this location. They've worked on the approved the floodplain management plan that Petro has in place. It does not have concerns with this development. And we, we believe that the commission should defer to Fort Lupton's judgment on this. They are the expert when it comes to impacts on their community. And again, with, re with respect to these, to the residential building unit owners that are, that are closest to this location, they have all signed informed consent. And that deserves a significant amount of weight in your analysis. These folks have lived around oil and gas for many years. They have lived around the gravel operations for many years, and yet they still have no concerns over this development plan. They're comfortable with it. And Petro would be removing equipment, removing tanks that are located closest to the RVUs and moving it further away, consolidating everything on this one location in the middle of the gravel operations. The gravel operations doesn't use sound walls or any other mitigation, mitigation equipment to avoid noise and dust and impacts to these folks. But Petro is. Petro is using sound walls. They are using noise mitigation. They are using light mitigation. They're minimizing their truck traffic. They are trying to reduce their impacts to these folks who, again, have not objected to this proposal. In fact, they've consented to the proposal. So I think what we, we have is a balance here, is that there is a need for this development. There's minerals to be developed. There are no feasible alternatives, no technically feasible alternatives. And you heard from Mr. Maxey as well, that Weld County is the proximate local government and they have no concerns about this, about this um, operations. I think when you balance all of these factors together, that this is the best plan for developing this mineral interest in this area. And it does avoid and it does mitigate impacts for the protection of public health, safety, welfare, and the environment. And with that, we request that the commission approve this application. Thank you. Thank you for uh, those remarks and sort of closing it out for us from your client and your perspective. Uh, I would like to offer the opportunity for staff to weigh in with any comments. Mr. Christopher, I believe, was the oil and gas location assessment that was assigned to this. And I'm not putting you on the spot, uh, Mr. Christopher. If you don't have any comments, that's fine. But I just want to hear from everyone uh, before we move toward deliberations. Well, I did want to bring up uh, the point that currently on the application, we don't have the commitment to the electrification of the production equipment. So uh, if that is committed to, we would uh, appreciate having that in a form that we could enforce. And that would be my comment. Great. Okay. We will take that point under advisement and thank you for bringing that to our attention. All right, uh, at this point, uh, does any commissioner have any further questions for the panel? All right, do we want to engage in deliberations? Commissioner Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Prashala and, and your team for your presentation today. Um, I, I'm going to reiterate what Commissioner McGowan said, and I think that in some ways this was probably a more difficult application than I anticipated, um, given some of the existing impacts based on the, the location with the mine. Um, 
I'll start off saying I think this is approvable, and I think it's approvable one because we haven't seen protests. We have Fort Lupton um, wanting approval. We have Will County wanting approval. We have informed consent, I think, which is probably the most important thing coming from the RBU owners nearby. Um, those things really stick out to me. Um, and when you look at it in that sense, I, I think it should be easily approvable. Um, but what I'll say is I, I had concerns with the application itself. Um, in my discussions with the OGLAs, I think that I, I'm in agreement. I think that this is the best location. Not only was it already disturbed, already set aside as an oil and gas location, um, it's also on a higher level of ground. So in the unfortunate event that there is any kind of flood, it's going to have less of a flooding impact than other locations nearby. Um, there's a lot of things to like about the location, but it doesn't detract from the fact that there are nearby water resources. It doesn't detract from the fact that there are, this is very close to a disproportionately impacted community that um, as, as Commissioner Oath um, discussed with the, the, envir the Enviro screen um, and Commissioner Messner pointed out as well, these are areas that already are impacted significantly. Um, and given that, I don't think that that means you can't have it there. I think what it means is that we have to take additional care and consideration of what's happening in that area. Um, I think some of the things that were a little troubling during the presentation today is that some of the information that would be particularly helpful wasn't necessarily available. Um, Things like Commissioner Ackerman asked about what kind of emission benefits would we have from the plugging and abandonment of the other wells? What kind of emission benefits would we have um, from the consolidation of the facilities? What kind of emission benefits would we have from taking these additional steps that, that Mr. Prasala rightfully said are mitigating factors and are benefits but we don't have clear details of them. We don't have clear details as to what kind of additional emissions would be. Um, Ms. Donahue is saying that it's going to be fairly minimal, um, but given that when you look at that Enviro screen, there are already high levels of emissions compared to other areas of Colorado, I think it's important to highlight what those even minimal changes are. So when I look at the, especially when you look at many of the public comments we've had, the push for the cumulative impacts and now legislative push for us addressing cumulative impacts to a greater degree, I don't think we can clearly get by and saying, well, there's gonna be some additional emissions, it's gonna be negligible. Um, with the efforts taken by um, the Environmental Justice Task Force, I don't think we can get by and just saying, this is an area that is impacted, and but it, it's it's going to have some benefits from plugging. It's going to have some additional information. It's going to have some additional emissions. But without qualifying that, we don't really have the ability to go back to other stakeholders and say, these are steps that we are taking as a commission to make sure that what the legislature is telling us, legislature is telling us to do, what stakeholders are telling us to do, we're we're actually following through on. Um, so, I mean, ultimately, when it comes down to it, I, I think that, like I said, I think this is an approvable application. I think the fact that we have informed consent is especially critical to this. Um, but what I'd like to see happen, if other commissioners agree and think that this should be approved, is I think we should have um, a couple of conditions of approval attached to this. Um, as Mr. Christopher just mentioned, I think that we need to make sure that any approval ensures that the there will be electrification of the facilities. Um, and then what I'd also like to see is number one, an update of that emissions information. Um, 
and that that's I think two parts the emissions that will be included by the additional drilling of the southern part of the DSU that was added later on um, as well as the emissions benefits that would happen from the consolidation and of facilities and the plugging and abandonment of the wells um, as opposed to just saying we have a good idea of those numbers, don't have them in front of us. The other condition that I'd like to see happen, um, and there was talk of the use of tier four engines if available, obviously, but I'd like to see that in writing. Um, we just approved the Coolstra OGDP yesterday and that exact language went in there. Um, to the extent that there is a tier four engine available, it will be used. And then if not available, then this is what's gonna go forward. Um, and I think it's important to include that language as a commitment um, in any approval, should it be granted as well. Thank you, Commissioner Cross. Other deliberative thoughts? Commissioner McGowan? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you for Commissioner Cross for for um, putting some, for setting the table, so to speak. I, I'm not sure I'm in the same place. I feel like this application lacked a lot of information that we normally get as part of our approval and recommendation process. I, I really don't get the feeling or the understanding of the actual commitments to minimize emissions for this location. And regardless of RBU owners, signing consent, it's still our job to ensure that we're avoiding minimizing and mitigating impacts, regardless of where location is. I actually think this is an appropriate location. It's on an already disturbed area. It's on an existing uh, location. Those are things that we encourage as part of our rule, Senate Bill 181 rulemaking. But we also have said we have concerns about emissions and how they impact communities and cumulative impacts. And I don't see that the operator came to the table with an other than it's really hard to get it. So I'm going to try, but I, I can't even commit to what I'm going to try to do. I'm really struggling with that. We have tier two engines being used and no effort from this operator to say, but there are things I can do to reduce emissions from a tier two engine perspective, which we've had other operators do for similar reasons and purposes, non-attainment area near people. Group two instead of group three, yeah, it might be hard to get, but obviously we can get it because other operators are getting it. Um, I'm st I still, even after all this conversation, I'm unsure if there's a commitment to quiet fleet during completions or if we're using still tier two engines for completions, I, I still don't know. And so therefore I'm gonna go back to what J Commissioner Mesner said, which is I can only, deliberate on what has been committed to. And I and I am not satisfied that what has been committed to minimizes impacts, which is part of what we're supposed to be looking at in our deliberation. So at this point, I'm a no vote. Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I appreciate my fellow commissioner's thoughts. Um, I'm going to I'll share my thoughts and do understand that I am deliberating right now. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm really just providing my thoughts to my fellow commissioners and um, some of the things that I'm thinking about as part of this application. Um, and, you know, I started by just developing a list of, you know, things that I thought were good about this application. Um, and I think that, you know, this is an existing location, it's an impacted location, it's inside of a existing industrial gravel pit um, surface use. Uh, you know, the applicant has uh, gained informed consent from the RBU, no, the RBU owners um, inside of 2000 feet, um, which does uh, enable them to be um, reviewed uh, under 604 b1 um 
There is remote shutting capabilities associated with this. They have committed to an electrification of production equipment. Um, uh, and I think that there's a lot of solid BMPs around noise, odor, lighting, uh, accessory emission reductions during uh, ozone non-attainment days, um, storm water management protocols, um, et cetera. And so I, I, I do think that there was um, an attempt made by this operator to commit to BMPs and practices that they know that they could commit to. Um, and I think that is always helpful uh, in an application. I acknowledge that um, the relevant local government has uh, provided um, conditional approval associated with this particular site. I will also state that local governments don't always have the same review processes as, uh, as are required within our rules. And so I don't abdicate my responsibility to ensure that an application meets the state of Colorado rules. Um, and requirements associated with review of this application. And, uh, and so I don't um, default to the local government's determination on any application, although I do take their authority uh, and perspective very seriously. Um, I do have issues with this application. Um, this is not a tankless facility. Um, there are permanent produced water tanks. There's no produced water takeaway. Um, and there is contemplated hydrocarbon storage um, that anticipates to be used occasionally on site. Um, there uh, is going to be tier two engines utilized for both drilling and completions on this particular site. Um, I think as Commissioner McGowan indicated on in a previous application that tier two engines are not something that we really see um, in applications anymore. They're not uh, standard practice within the uh, the the areas within the non-attainment area within the state, and there's a number of reasons for that. I think operators throughout the state are realizing that in order to be able to um, operate in certain parts of the state of Colorado, that they have to utilize the best technology that's available in order to be able to uh, avoid, minimize, and mitigate potential adverse impacts associated with their operations. And Tier 2 engines um, are not that. Um, the group two drilling mud, um, you know, they're, they're, I'm less concerned about the odor associated with the drilling muds, particularly in this situation, um, but I still acknowledge that there's a different emissions profile associated with group two drilling mud than there is with group three drilling mud, and that emissions profile, again, uh, is, a, is a, a cumulative impact associated with operations that I think needs to be um, evaluated and addressed in an application. Um, I, I've got a lot of heartburn around the proximity, proximity to shallow groundwater at this. I mean, when you talk about local government jurisdictions and local government um, evaluations of floodplains, local governments in the state of Colorado and the state of Colorado, two separate things, the state, um, have really different um, expectations and um, authorities around protection of groundwater. And so in a local government review of a, of a land use application, groundwater protection is not necessarily one of the criteria that they're focused on, even in evaluating you know, floodplain um, scenarios. And so um, I'm, I'm not uh, familiar enough with Fort Lupton's review uh, and, uh, uh, and their providing of a, a floodplain um, permit. But I do know that the state of Colorado has an authority and a responsibility to protect groundwater. Um, and I do have concern about the proximity to the groundwater, the depth of the groundwater at five feet, and that surface water connectivity to groundwater aquifers um, within this particular area. Um, I do think that the operator has put together a package of BMPs um, that are around stormwater management, um, that, that, that's a pretty standard package of, of, um, of stormwater management tools. Um, it's, it's the applicant's responsibility to make a showing to, to, to have the burden of proof to ensure that those BMPs actually do, um, that, are, that they are protective of groundwater and 
I'm not sure on that one. I'm not sure one way or another on that one. It's not clear to me that it is protective in this site, um, in this whole DSU. And I understand the groundwater challenges and the surface water challenges with this entire DSU as far as determining a site, which is why I think, you know, in an ALA analysis, that in-depth analysis of the of the different elements of different sites and, you know, how groundwater um, is affected in these different areas and how surface water is located in these different areas and really a clear analysis that helps me uh, help you make a determination and a, a meet the burden of proof that the proposal uh, through the ALA analysis is actually going to be protective of, of groundwater. So I'm, I'm, I'm on the fence on that one. Um, I really appreciate CDPHE's um, willingness to provide the Enviro screen. I mean, I think this is a tool that will um, that many agencies within the state of Colorado will continue to use um, more and more. Um, and uh, and I, I think it's really a helpful tool in, in looking at you know, uh, evaluating and addressing cumulative impacts of a, a, a whole range of things. I appreciate Commissioner Oath um, kind of highlighting that um, there are some specific pieces inside of that Enviro screen that are specific to oil and gas and those indicators and a lot of uh, scenarios, you know, are in the 99th percentile. Um, and to me, that's significant. That's an important information for me and uh, kind of highlights the, um, the necessary and reasonable aspects to employ the best technology available to minimize, avoid, uh, minimize and mitigate potential adverse impacts uh, to uh, a number of sensitive receptors in this, uh, in this particular area. Um, uh, I acknowledge that the census block, even within uh, the Enviro screen uh, report um, is not determined to be a disproportionately impacted community, but it is at 79.1%, which certainly pushes it very close to being in a disproportionately impacted community as defined by EnviroScreen. Um, but I also acknowledge that just over 800 feet away in which one of the RBUs is located, that census block is actually at 89% um, when you look at comprehensively the EnviroScreen report. And so um, that to me is also important information to know in my deliberative process um, in determining uh, what type of technologies and BMPs an operator needs to propose in order to meet the burden of proof uh, that they are um, protecting public health, safety, welfare, the environment, and wildlife resources. Um, I also acknowledge that in my decision making, I am taking into consideration the direction that we've received from the governor on emissions reductions in the non-attainment area and whether or not this application actually um, contemplates um, taking steps towards those uh, NOx or emissions reductions associated with that direction. And I think it's, um, you know, I think that just because there's no protest, just because there's uh, local government support doesn't abdicate us for our responsibility to ensure that this application meets the rules and requirements um, that we're statutorily obliged to follow um, as part of our review process. And so um, to me, that's important information to receive, um, but that's not uh, a cornerstone in which I make my decision. Um, you know, reasonable and necessary is a really important piece as far as my deliberative process. And as I look at all of these different um, pieces of the puzzle in this particular application, um, and apply uh, a lens of reasonable and necessary. I do think that it is reasonable and necessary to expect that there is a very high level of technology of BMPs proposed, you know, on an application in a, in a scenario like this, just like we've required that of other operators in the past with applications that have a really similar profile to this. And so I'm likely wanting to apply those same expectations and standards to this particular application and would feel uncomfortable um, not applying uh, the, the same expectations for an application like this that is really similar in its profile to other applications that we've looked at and really pushed operators to um, do better. 
And so um, with all of that, um, you know, I think my last point is that, you know, technical feasibility is not a consideration that, that we're allowed to uh, take into consideration as part of our deliberative process. Supply chains issues are not something that we, uh, you know, statutorily, you know, enabled to be able to take into consideration, you know, the lens that I'm looking at is through reasonable and necessary, which could include some of those things, but again, are not the cornerstone of my decision making as far as determining whether uh, application is protective of public health, safety, welfare, the environment and wildlife resources. And so um, I do have to say that I, I probably at this point I'm leaning um, towards not believing that this application is approvable. Um, I certainly want to hear my other commissioners thoughts before I make a final determination of that. I do think that there's a possibility in this uh, scenario where the applicant could take a step back, they could rethink some of the things that they're proposing here, and perhaps propose something that, in my opinion, could be approvable, um, but that's not what we have in front of us today. Uh, and so those are my initial thoughts, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the time given to speak. Thank you. Commissioner Ackerman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to my fellow commissioners for their comments. And I'm probably not going to add a whole lot to what's already been said, but also concur um, with all the points that have been made. Um, I, I reiterate that I also believe this is an appropriate location and, and, and very much want to encourage continued development in already disturbed areas, trying to uh, you know not, not spread out industrial disturbance, but rather to consolidate it and continue to applaud the applicant for uh, that approach. I also note that it is supported by staff and by Fort Lupton and Weld County. Um, I do have concerns with the ALA and, and just want to make a general statement that goes beyond this application and uh, remind all operators that the, <clears throat> excuse me, the ALA is not intended to select alternative locations that are, you know, inferior to the preferred or proposed location um, in their in their protection of health, safety, welfare, the environment, and wildlife resources in order to bolster the preferred alternative. I'm not stating that that's what's been done here, but uh, with staff's assertion that there could be other locations that would be more preferable, it certainly is a consideration. And I do think that operators need to be very careful to evaluate when, when the ALA requirements are triggered to honestly and, and thoroughly evaluate all potential uh, ALA alternative locations, regardless of technical or financial feasibility, uh, is the most appropriate approach under our regulations today. I agree that this application was lacking on many fronts, and I also am, am particularly concerned that many of our questions were not able to be directly answered. Uh, I agree with Commissioner McGowan and Commissioner Messner that, that we do have to base our decisions on the information that's available to us. <clears throat> uh, it also does not escape me that we're operating in, in the ozone non-attainment area without the most significant efforts uh, being employed to reduce emissions. Um, the application has shortcomings on BMPs. It's not tankless, as has been pointed out. There's no produced water takeaway. The ALA was lacking. Tier 2 engines for drilling and fracking are not uh, the best standard. Uh, it's in a floodplain, has groundwater issues, uh, and all of the other things that have been reiterated by my fellow commissioners. That said, while it's significantly lacking compared with other applications that we've reviewed, I think it could be argued on a point-by-point -point basis that this application may be technically compliant with our regulations uh, under the letter of the law. Um, but I, I want to flag that this kind of an approach especially within the non-attainment area, a floodplain and shallow groundwater with DIC issues, even with informed consent, makes these decisions, as you can tell, very difficult. And I would note that I think this type of approach seems like a, a sure path to extending discussions about the need for more stringent regulations, more stringent practices, and continued tightening down on a, on a, technically, uh, on a technical level of our regulations and other controlling uh, documentation. And I think that you know, working to employ best management practices on a voluntary basis and, uh, and, and working to plan for those resources to be available 
in a development is very helpful to the overall process of clean and proper development of oil and gas in Colorado. Uh, that said, I also would appreciate an effort by Petro, if they are amenable, to consider and address some of the issues raised by commissioners today to determine whether or not they may be able to bolster or improve this application in, in, in the ways that we've talked about. And if they are not able or willing to do that, and this goes to a vote today, it, it's, it's a difficult decision for me and I'm still working on, on where I sit, so thank you. All right, uh, thank you, commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Oath, please. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, as a non-voting member, I don't often chime in here during deliberations, but just listening to the conversation um, and, I, and it's hard to know at this point, uh, you know, uh, where um, the commission will go with this application, but did have one thought I'd share in case I heard at least Commissioner Cross talk about um, approval with some conditions and, and particularly um, with staff suggestion of, you know, a condition specifically calling out, you know, using the tier four engines um, if technically feasible. And as I'm listening, and thinking about that, I'm thinking about the implementability of that, you know, as staff, like who assesses that and based on what information and what is the expectation from Petro. Um, so I think I'd encourage some thinking around what is that expectation? Is there an expectation that Petro provide, you know, an, a, an a information to staff about, you know, what they've um, attempted to do and some thoughts on, you know, what, what, would be considered sufficient to, to determine, you know, that it's not feasible. Um, I know that that was not done with with Coolster yesterday, but I think that's distinguishable in that, you know, the, the backup there, if it was not feasible, was um, in a way that had kind of commensurate emissions. Um, and so I think in this case, it may be even if, if it, this were to move forward, that may be more important. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you, Commissioner Oath, for those points. Uh, I don't know that I'm as adequately prepared with my deliberative thoughts as my well-informed fellow commissioners. Uh, I think that uh, I look at this on balance. That, uh, But actually, before I move forward, I see that Mr. Bashala has raised his hand. Yes, if you don't mind, Chair Robbins. Um, <clears throat> before you provide your, your deliberative remarks. Um, I just was conferring with my client and wanted to uh, at least provide some responses to both the conditions of approval that were suggested by Commissioner Cross and some other items that had uh, come up uh, during the hearing. And so if I may. Yes, please. Uh, the, the conditions of approval as uh, suggested by Commissioner Cross, uh, yes, uh, Petro can commit to those. Uh, with respect to uh, the group three, group two, group three mud, uh, Petro is uh, is prepared to commit to using group three mud to address uh, Commissioner McGowan, Commissioner Messner's concerns with respect to the emissions uh, on the mud. They are committed. Petro is committed to using a quiet frack fleet. They would commit to no hydrocarbon storage on site. So that would mean uh, no collection of hydrocarbons uh, on that location whatsoever. Um, the still again the commitment as as uh, suggested in the condition of approval by Commissioner Cross, the to use of tier four engines if feasible. Uh, and then with respect to the, I think it was actually one of Commissioner Cross's uh, conditions of approval as well, to calculate those emissions associated with the three wells that would be plugged and abandoned. Thank you. Uh, does that conclude the responsive remarks? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, with that, uh, I appreciate that uh, and those commitments. Uh, I was going to say that at the end of the day, uh, our rules and regulations require this commission to balance development of protective oil and gas resources within the state uh, in a manner that is reasonable and necessary to ensure protection of public health, safety, welfare, environment, and wildlife resources. Uh, I don't believe that we, that in undertaking that balance, that we are required to 
establish specific technical components that are identical time and time again. Uh, I think that we look at the application as a whole and try to make it a, a difficult determination um, in these instances. Uh, on balance, I find this uh, this application in particular with the commitments just made by Mr. Pashala and uh, the applicant here to be approvable. Uh, I don't need to go through the things. I appreciate uh, Commissioner Messner sort of, here's the good category and here's the bad category. And I probably tend to agree quite a bit with uh, that identification of things. I think on balance though, that uh, this commissioner at, would be comfortable voting in favor, in particular with the conditions of approval as identified by Mr. Prashala. I would want Ms. Mercer, our AAG, to help frame the technical feasibility of a tier four engine piece. I think it needs to be some, some form of reporting from the applicant with kind of a review as to practicability by the director at the time closer to actual drilling that something is going to happen. So I kind of mutter through that a little bit, but I'm sure that AG Mercer will do a fantastic job if we get to a point where we've got three votes in favor of, of capitulating that into a uh, operable condition of approval. So I'll stop there. Um, AG Mercer, would you like a moment or two to kind of, uh, you do a really good job of collecting all the potential conditions of approval as we go through this. Uh, perhaps I'd like you to, and I'm not swaying that the vote's a yes or a no, I'm just swaying that if it is a yes vote, what would those conditions of approval look like? Um, sure, Mr. Chair. So the conditions of approval that I have um, tracked, um, all of which um, the applicant has agreed to, um, are the um, conditions of approval as uh, articulated by Commissioner Cross, which are an agreement to electrification of the production facilities, um, an agreement to update the emissions info um, in the form 2B, um, including two components. The first is to account for the additional drilling for the um, later added southern part of the DSU, the second being a quantification of the emissions benefits from the consolidation of facilities and plugging abandonment of wells. Um, there's also a commitment to use tier four engines if they are available and to the extent that a tier four engine is not available, or sorry, yes, if, the, if a tier four engine is not available, Petro would use tier two engines. Um, and I was starting to work up some language um, and potentially run it by staff regarding what that sort of decision tree will look like on um, showing that they've made efforts to use tier four. Um, Petro also committed to using group three drilling mud. They committed to using a quiet frack fleet and committed to no hydrocarbon storage on site. Um, and I would imagine um, with the sort of combination of those commitments that staff might be looking for additional updates to the various um, plans and emissions data that uh, Petro has submitted. And that is that is my list. Great, thank you. And I've written that down as six, I think, potential conditions of approval with a couple of sub conditions that you're still working on. Uh, would it be helpful to take a 10 minute break for you to touch base with staff on the iteration that you just did? Again, I'm not judging, prejudging one way or another, which way we're going. I just want to know if we're going in one direction, what that going looks like. Yes, that would be helpful if I could have a few minutes to confer with staff. Let's return at 11.53. Mr. Chair. Oh. Could we also, could someone also define for me what we mean by no hydrocarbon storage on site? Thanks. Mr. Prashala, do you want to weigh in on that? Yes, and just received clarification that was very timely, Commissioner McGowan. Uh, that is no oil tanks on site, uh, but would keep the two produced water tanks on site just because there's no pipeline takeaway for that. Great question, great answer. Appreciate both of those points. Um, let's continue unless there's other questions. 
to give staff and the, our attorney general a few moments and we'll return at 11.54. Uh, uh, Carefully returning here, recording is going again. I want to make sure that uh, Ms. Mercer and staff had a chance to collaborate a little bit. Hello, Commission. Sorry, I was just hanging up with staff. Um, can it, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, um, great. So um, I worked with uh, Ms. Trask, Mr. Christopher, and Mr. Noto to um, get some language around the various COAs that, um, that Petro has agreed to. And, oh, sorry. Um, and I've, I've got a list here on my screen. Um, we did have a few questions um, for the operator um, that are, are referenced in here. So just give me one moment to um, share my screen if I could. All right, can folks see my, my screen with the Word document up? We can. Is it large enough to read? In my mind it is, yes. Okay. Um, give folks a moment to read. Um, there are, so the, the idea here is that the, the sort of top line bullets are um, in most cases the, the COA. And then um, as has been our standard practice in some of these sub bullets, we detailed um, what staff needs in order to memorialize the various commitments. Those don't necessarily need to go on, on the 2A, but we would capture them in the order just so it's clear what folks need to do. Um, there is down under the, the drilling engine COA, a question for the applicant. Um, and then the updates to the form 2B would include all of the sub bullets. So hopefully I haven't made things more confusing there. No, I think this is uh, helpful and straightforward. Um, Mr. Prashala, I would note that perhaps you and your client are seeing this for the first time, uh, would allow you an opportunity to visit with your client, client offline if that's necessary, um, your call. Yeah, we're looking this through and well, to answer the question, I think that's the easiest place to start. Uh, it would be diesel, not natural gas on the tier two engine. Okay. And uh, I think, yeah, if I could just have one moment and then uh, on the tier four, uh, COA, I think we're good with it, but if I could just have one moment. Yeah, please take your time and just re-visualize yourself when you're ready to talk to us. Chair Robbins. Yes, sir. We've had an opportunity to review. Uh, Petra was agreeable to the conditions of approval as drafted by staff. Okay. Um, all right, then with that, uh, we will move back into deliberations. And I see that Commissioner Messner has raised his hand. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the I've got a question. The quiet completion fleet, that doesn't, I don't know, that's a defined term, right? Is that a tier two engine? Is it a tier four engine? What does that actually mean? Uh, this is. This is Alex Corey again. Uh, they, the companies we work with have both uh, tier four and tier two quiet fleets. Um, so that's a, a, a design for noise mitigation. Uh, as far as the engine tiers go, they do have both. Um, again, we'll strive to get the tier four if, if available. So that's, but the question was brought up of whether or not it was even a quiet fleet. And I just wanted to make sure it was clear. It will be a quiet fleet, so. But but you're not you're not committing in that BMP to tier four engine. I think the commitment on tier four is that they will, as drafted in the condition, that they will, uh, you know, attempt to use tier four, and if they can't use tier four, they got to explain why. Well, it says that for the drilling rig, it doesn't say it for the completions fleet. I can put this back up on the screen if you'd like. Yeah. Go ahead, Ms. Mercer. Um, 
Perhaps so. Uh, Commissioner Messner is correct that that language regarding um, trying to and explaining if they can't relates to the drilling engine. We could certainly um, add that to the quiet completions fleet BMP or COA if desired. Well, I think what I heard from the applicant is that they're going to use a quiet completions fleet irrespective of of whether they get the tier four drilling engine. That is correct. I believe the, or sorry, I'll let Commissioner Messner clarify. Mr. Chair, I mean, the, the completions fleet is separate and different than the drilling rig and the engines associated with it. And I guess I'm, I'm not sure how the two things would tie together, at least with my understanding is that you know, you could use a, a tier four engine for your completions fleet and a tier two engine for your drilling rig or both tier four or both tier two, but they're not part and parcel to one another. I think for clarification from our end, uh, we, we'd be okay with that um, tier four um, COA as a applying to both drilling and to completions engines. Further follow up, Commissioner Messner? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, just trying to create clarity in whatever the BMPs that are being proposed actually are doing. So, before we move into deliberations, uh, the point made by Commissioner Messner is a good one. We want to make sure we've got things clear. Are there other clarifying comments with regard to the proposed COAs? Seeing none, uh, do commission, go ahead. Mr. Chair, if I may, um, it just uh, came up that I, I'm not sure whether the tier four COA as drafted completely addresses um, what Commissioner Oath um, asked for. I know, um, so under this language, they, um, the applicant would be required to explain um, why, if, if the tier four engine's not available, they would have to explain that in writing to staff. As written, um, this COA wouldn't give staff any um, authority to really do anything if they um, didn't like that explanation from the applicant. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that that was understood by folks. And if there's a desire to expand on the language, we can certainly draft something more in there. Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't mean to be a pain, but um, because I think from my opinion, whether or not these um, COAs get developed or not, I'm not sure that actually uh, changes my perspective on the decision here. Um, but I also I'm having a little bit of heartburn trying to do this on the fly, you know, in an application that didn't provide these things initially. And um, I, I guess I'm I'm. I'm wondering if there's any particular reason that we have to um, try to do this on the fly and put staff and the applicant under pressure to try to come up with something here versus continuing this for another week. Let the applicant think about this a little bit, let staff think about this a little bit and trying to draft something that's uh, appropriate for consideration that actually meets everything. Once we provide all the information that other commissioners may want to provide in developing these, but that's just a, a deliberative thought. Well, uh, first off, we don't have a meeting next week, um, so it would have to be continued to July 12th. Uh, my second thought is, you know, I'm pretty comfortable that we're pretty close here um, with regard to language. I uh, would want to uh, talk with commissioners about the tier four and the provision of reasonable explanation, et cetera. Uh, I'm comfortable trying to work through this today. It's just a second commissioner's deliberative thoughts. I'm also comfortable in indicating to the world at large that with these conditions of approval, I'm a yes vote. Others with deliberative thoughts? Commissioner Cross? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
I agree that I think we are close today. Um, I, I I think I would appreciate staff's thoughts on um, if they have additional concerns on this. Um, but otherwise, I think we can try and talk out what we need a detail with respect to the if available language and, and checking that. But um, I, I agree that I think we're we're fairly close and. I, I guess I'd also like to get an idea from other commissioners, um, similar to what you said, Mr. Chair, that um, if this is futile, <laughs> if this is going to be a, a no vote for, for some anyway, even with the conditions of approval, if this would, um, if it's worth trying to get to that. But um, I think with these conditions of approval, if we can get that, if available language worked out, I would also be a yes vote. Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to provide my thoughts and, uh, you know, always appreciate trying to be solution oriented during hearing and try to come up with conditions of approval. Um, I also think it's important from my perspective, um, you know, as we review applications, it's not our responsibility to be prescriptive in what's expected from a, a, an applicant as far as meeting our rules and regulations. Um, but rather evaluate what's being presented to us to determine whether it uh, is protective and meets um, our rules and regulations, as well as reviewing it for reasonable and necessary. Um, and uh, Mr. Chair, I appreciate that you brought that up. I also brought it up in my deliberations that reasonable and necessary is the lens that these things need to be reviewed through um, as per the act. Um, and as I look at this, I think it's reasonable and necessary to expect that an application be proposed um, that meets the rules and requirements of uh, the, the COGCC, um, that it, uh, uh, it's reasonable and necessary to expect that it avoids um, significant adverse impacts um, and avoids, minimizes, and mitigates these impacts um, to the best of their ability. Um, I, as I indicated before, I mean, uh, application with this profile, with the um, receptors that are associated with it, with the location that the applicant has chosen, um, with the evaluation that they've provided, and with the explanations that they've shared as to why they propose what they propose and um, why they cited it the way that they cited it. I'm not going to be able to support this application because I'm not being prescriptive that a certain tier of engine needs to be developed or a certain technology needs to be employed, but that what they are proposing doesn't meet the standards, um, even with the COAs that are provided because the COAs um, around an emission profile associated with a particular engine doesn't say anything. It just says that they'll try. Um, and it doesn't actually say that they're going to commit to anything. I understand supply chain issues. I understand technical feasibility. I understand, you know, trying to work with surface owners as far as developing surface use agreements. Um, but these are all things that, um, you know, need to be subsequent to my decision as far as whether a site that's being proposed with the applicant's burden of proof. Um, meets meets the standards associated with our rules and regulations and is protective of public health, safety, welfare, the environment, and wildlife resources. Um, as I indicated before, this is, you know, in a non-attainment area. Uh, I think the viral score report tells a pretty um, clear story as far as what's happening around this particular area. I think the proximity to water um, is a significant consideration. Um, and I think the emissions profiles um, associated with some of the things that are being proposed um, have, you know, issues associated with not only the RBU owners that may be within 2,000 feet of this particular situation, but also the cumulative impacts associated for, um, you know, residents within the non-attainment area. And so I'm a no vote on this one as proposed. As I indicated, I think there's opportunities for the applicant to propose um, modified um, a modified application that pot potentially addresses some of the things that have been brought up today, but um, I'm not sure that the BMPs that are being proposed fully cover that. 
Um, so that's my thoughts. Mr. Ackerman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I agree with um, all of those points made by Commissioner Messner. I have a little bit different of a take in that I uh, I think that these are all BMPs that should be employed. I think there are BMPs that are reasonable to be asked for. I think, like I said before, this application was lacking and and could have addressed these um, earlier, uh, could have been a little more responsive to staff requests. That said, I'm I'm leaning on the technical compliance with our regulations. And I, I'm finding it difficult to, to identify specific regulations that this violates. I, I, I do agree with Commissioner Messner, I, I believe, and I don't want to put words in, in your mouth, Commissioner Messner, but I do believe that we have some concerns associated with potentially the intent of the, uh, the act uh, to properly protect public health, safety, welfare, and the environment. Our regulations are intended to do that subsequent to the act as it was passed. And um, as I mentioned, I think that this is technically very close, but compliant. And with the COAs uh, and with my, my point of view being that I believe in support the integrity of our regulations in upholding the purposes of the act, that I would uh, just barely be a yes vote um, probably uh, with these COAs properly implemented. That said, I, I very much believe that everyone could benefit from a step back and a real true effort to um, more adequately address the things that Petro is able to address associated with our comments today. Thank you, Commissioner Ackerman. For the comments, Commissioner McGowan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> and these conditions of approval actually I think are going to move me uh, to a better place. I think, I think this would be even better. And I'm sorry to add something a day late and a dollar short. If the conditions of approval also included efforts explored by the operator to reduce emissions from the tier two engines if they have to use tier two, and why they couldn't use those alternate techniques to reduce emissions from tier two. So going to the point of being reasonable and necessary, we can't we can't ask or require something that doesn't exist for the operator. And I I think that operators have been pretty clear. They reach out to an electric company, for example, and sometimes they cannot take on the load. It's just not possible. It would not be reasonable for us to say you have to electrify if it actually doesn't exist. I think what is difficult for me here is that I know some alternatives exist. And I don't feel like the operator has explored them and explained to us why they haven't chosen to use them to figure out how alternate ways to reduce emissions in the non-attainment area, close to RBUs, et cetera. Um, so I feel like if, if there's a way for the operator to show a good faith effort and why they can't, why it's not feasible for them, I think that brings me to a better place as part of this application. And again, I don't know if this all needs to happen today and, I, and how the operator feels about that, but the, it, it really felt, sorry guys, but it really felt like there was no effort put into this application to, to be thoughtful about how you were going to avoid and minimize and then mitigate. It, it just felt sloppy. Commissioner Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I just want to confirm with Commissioner McGowan that she's referring to, I, I know I'm past application, some of the alternatives included um, maybe a dual use, a fuel additive, um, the battery option to supplement that. That's what you're going to talk about. I, I'd, be in, I'd be intrigued with that as well. I, I think that's another step. And um, I will say, I, I agree with Commissioner Messner. This is not meant to be prescriptive or anything else. But I think that as we move forward with this, I think this is an opportunity um, for us to work with the operator to ensure that we are trying to determine what can be done um, in order to protect public health, well, welfare, safety, environment, and wildlife resources. Okay, um, we now have further deliberative thoughts that uh, in my mind um, is asking staff, the applicant, and the AG to kind of talk through at least that uh, tier four engine piece 
And so, Mr. Prashala, not to put you on the spot, but I'm putting you on the spot. Uh, what would a continuance to July 12th look like from you and your client's perspective so that we can see if we can get this um, hammered out in, in due course as opposed to right now? Give me one moment. Yes, you have how many moments you may need. We can agree to a continuance to July 12th. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I think with that, uh, we've heard deliberative thoughts from commissioners. I think that uh, both you, uh, your client and staff and the AGs have a teeny bit of homework to do. Uh, let's get that homework refined and let's uh, move to continue this to the July 12th hearing. Uh, we'll put this at the beginning of the agenda so that we don't burden you with other OGDPs or other business that may happen on that date. Uh, I think I just made a motion to continue this matter to July 12th. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, we have a couple of seconds. So two seconds and a motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, seeing no none opposed. Uh, we want to uh, thank everyone for the continued efforts here. Uh, I think that the deliberations as well as the application and the work by staff uh, show to the world that we really are trying to do a very good job um, in the state of Colorado to ensure that we're meeting the standards set by SB 19181. I think the deliberations, the staff, the applicants' application also suggests to the world that it ain't, it ain't easy, but we're getting it done. And so uh, with that, uh, I think we have concluded the business on the agenda for today. And so unless you have anything further, Mr. Prashala? Yeah, I would just like to echo your comments, Chair Robbins, that we very much, uh, we being Petro and myself, very much appreciate the collaborative effort in the deliberations to try to work toward uh, a better overall uh, outcome. Uh, and that's for the benefit of uh, Petro, as well as uh, the persons that are most impacted, as well as the public at large. And so we are very appreciative of the ability to uh, continue to work with staff and come back on July 12th and see if we can't uh, come to uh, presenting a development plan that uh, you do believe satisfies, that all commissioners believe satisfies. Uh, the Conservation Act and Commission rules. So thank you very much. No, I appreciate that. And I guess I would sort of finish that thought that I started and that you segued off of is, you know, I think all the commissioners, I think staff as well, uh, and I think applicants are all learning um, as we move through uh, implementation of this. Uh, and, you know, I think that what we heard from commissioners and probably what we would have heard from staff is, you know, take lessons learned um, in terms of the filing of applications. Uh, we've, we have now created a body of case law, a body of evidence, a body of deliberative thoughts that I think helps to flesh out the reasonableness and the necessariness of actions. And so I encourage all of our operators who are listening in to uh, take that into account and I think that that will make for uh, processes that are uh, more easily worked through uh, by the commissioners, by staff, by applicants, by everyone that's involved in the work that we're doing. So we'll end with that. Do we have a motion to adjourn? No, no, no. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Great. Everybody have a great 4th of July weekend. See you next week.